Well, hello, and welcome to everyone joining us for this X Talks webinar. Today's talk is entitled Transitioning Drug Products or Vaccines into a Pre Filled Blow Fill Seal Drug Delivery Device. My name is Corey Stanton, and I'll be your X Talks host for this event. Today's presentation runs for approximately 60 minutes, and the webinar includes an interactive Q&A session at the end. To make the most of this session, feel free to submit questions and comments for our speakers throughout the presentation, and we'll try to attend to as many as possible. If you're joining us via GoToWebinar, you can use the Questions chat box, which is located in the control panel on the right-hand side of your screen. And if you require any assistance, please don't hesitate to contact me by sending a message using this very same chat box. And if you're viewing this presentation from our LinkedIn Live event, you can submit your questions using the Comments tab on LinkedIn. Please note that all audience members are in listen-only mode and that this event will be recorded and made available for streaming to those who registered on xtalks.com. At this point, I'd like to thank Apigec who developed the content for this presentation. Apigec Systems Corp is a public benefit medical technology company that has pioneered a new category of pre-filled injection devices with economic, supply chain, and sustainability advantages over traditional offerings. Their mission is to make the safety and performance benefits of pre-filled injections affordable and available for most, if not all, injections around the world. The company's technology platform is anchored by a well-established manufacturing process called Blow Fill Seal, or BFS. BFS is a widely used sterile liquid packaging technology that has been recognized by the FDA as an advanced aseptic process. And now let's take a moment to meet our panelists for today's presentation. One of our speakers today is Christian Eichhorn. With over 19 years in process and packaging development, Christian leads Apigec's process and packaging disciplines, overseeing strategy and technical execution across product life cycles. Previously, he spent 12 years at West Pharmaceutical Services, where he led teams developing new products and integrating technologies like additive manufacturing. He also founded an analytical engineering team and co-led the Innovation Playbook Initiative to support global innovation practices. And also joining us today is Joseph Wojcik. As leader of the pharma development team at Apigec, Joe oversees client projects from a lab scale to late stage development, focusing on formulation, tech transfer, and product development in blow fill seal technology. With over 17 years in drug development, Joe supports device programs and strategic business planning. He has also helped launch a BFS technology development center and led a project to build and deploy an automated inspection machine for Apigec sterile injectable devices. And now, without any further ado, I'd like to hand the mic over to Joe to kick off the presentation. Joe, send me screen control now, and the floor is yours. See my screen? We're all good, ready to go. All right, thank you, Corey. Thank you for the warm introduction, and thank you, everybody, for joining us this afternoon. Let's go ahead and get started on transitioning your drug product into a BFS container. All right, so... A couple key learning objectives that we're going to cover today. Technical considerations for material compatibility, process parameters, and drug stability. We're going to talk about how prototyping and feasibility studies can resolve potential BFS challenges. And we're going to touch on the key factors in formulation, packaging, and regulatory filings for BFS products. And before we go any further with the presentation, we have a quick poll for the audience. Corey, could you go ahead and pull that up, please? Yes, that's right. Thank you, Joe. We do have an interactive poll question for audience members to respond to in real time. Appearing on your screen now, you can vote on this question by clicking on any of the answers and hitting the submit button. And the question we have for you is we'd simply like to just get to know a little bit about our audience who is here today and ask you, what is your primary motivation for considering BFS technology for your drug product? And your options are cost reduction, improved environmental sustainability, uh, enhanced supply chain uh, raw materials and distribution, the finished product, or compliance with new regulation. And once again, your question for you today is, what is your primary motivation for considering BFS technology for your drug product? And again, we're just looking to get a sense of who our audience is here, who's attending today, and uh, why you're interested in BFS technology. And once more, those options are cost reduction, improved environmental sustainability, enhanced supply chain, uh, raw materials, and distribution, finished product, or compliance with new regulation. Thank you to our audience members who have already voted. If you haven't had a chance to vote yet, make sure you cast your vote now and hit the submit button. I'll leave the poll open a little while longer to allow us to get a majority of our audience vote, and then we'll go ahead and close the poll and take a quick look at those results. Uh, one more reminder, we're just looking to get a sense of what your primary motivation is for considering BFS technology for your drug product. 
I'm going to go ahead and close the poll in just about 10, 15 seconds now. So if you haven't had a chance to vote, make sure you cast your vote now. Uh, very simple. All you have to do is just click on one of the options and hit the submit button. Excellent. Going to go ahead and close the poll now and let's take a quick peek at those results. Bit of an even split here. We've got uh, a third of our audience coming in at cost reduction, uh, another third of our audience at improved environmental sustainability, and finally a third of our audience looking to enhance their supply chain and distribution. Joe, I'm going to send things back to you. All right. Thank you, Corey. All right. So if, if you're attending today's webinar, you may already understand why BFS or Blowfill Seal is gaining traction as an alternative to traditional drug delivery containers, namely glass ones. If you don't know, here's what you need to know. Glass is not meeting the demands and the risks of the modern world. Today, cost pressures, supply chain challenges, and sustainability targets are changing the way that we need to think about drug containers and drug delivery. So if you're new to BFS, I'm gonna show a quick two minute video that's going to explain a lot. And if you're really, really, really new to BFS, mom, I know you're out there watching the webinar, this is what I do for work. All right, Corey, why don't you play the video? At Epiject, we are creating pre-filled drug delivery systems that combine the simplicity and quality of pre-filled devices with the scale and affordable cost of glass vials. We achieve this by bringing together two globally trusted technologies. The first is an advanced aseptic filling process called Blow, Fill, Seal, or BFS for short. BFS enables the dose to be aseptically filled and sealed in a container made just seconds before at large scale and efficient cost. And the second technology is high precision plastic injection molding, which is how we create our attachable components that convert BFS containers into pre-filled drug delivery systems. But we did not just create a platform for pre-filled drug delivery. We also developed the necessary technologies to make this platform practical for pharma companies to adopt. This includes enhanced temperature management of the drug product throughout the filling process, high-speed visual inspection, and supply chain simplification. Speaking of supply chain, the Epiject platform has a very simple and resilient supply chain that typically only requires two essential ingredients, virgin resin and cannula. And this simplicity translates into a life cycle with a 60% lower carbon footprint than single dose glass vials and syringes. All these benefits add up to an injectable delivery platform that helps make every dose better through accelerated production, lowered costs, and supply chain simplicity. The Appyject platform, transforming drug delivery so more injectables reach more patients in a simple pre-filled format. All right, thank you, Corey. Next slide. All right, BFS has the ability to be used for a wide range of drug containers and delivery technologies. Here on the screen are some of Appyject's standard drug delivery devices for common routes of administration. You're gonna notice a common theme here. In the top row, we have flexible, customizable blowfill seal containers. In the middle row, rigid connector, and in the bottom row, the associated applicator. This is not your father's blowfill seal. The inherent versatility and level of customization with blowfill seal today has transformed it from a simple container to a drug delivery technology. Now, today's discussion is supposed to be agnostic to whatever BFS container you're looking to transition to. However, it would be darn near impossible for us to paint this topic with a broad brush and give you meaningful content. So if we explain something today, that doesn't exactly align with your product type, please bear in mind that our frame of reference is coming from injectable products. All right, so our first part here is gonna be the R&D assessment. This assessment can be broken up into two distinct activities that are used to de-risk a program as we progress into commercial readiness. The first activity entails some work on the bench, and the second activity involves a manufacturing bench. Okay, let's go ahead and jump into it. So you've decided on taking this journey and transitioning our product into BFS. 
This can be either one of the existing products in your portfolio, or it's transitioning an existing on-market drug or vaccine into BFS. In either case, you would start at the same spot. You need to answer the basic question, do we have a chemical compatibility issue? From the standpoint of performing a paper-based assessment, it's pretty easy. The only thing you're evaluating is the drug or vaccine's compatibility with low density polyethylene. In our case, it's 100% virgin pharmaceutical grade. Mostly, it's unique applications with organic solvents that don't make it past this stage. In my experience, the vast majority of pharmaceutical products I've come across pass this initial SNP test. Once you've confirmed a paper based assessment, you're going to proceed to the next step, which is hand filling. Now, to get, to get started with hand filling, you need empty containers. Um, the specifics of the study is going to vary, but the gist of it is you poke a hole in the container, you transfer in your drug, you seal it up, and you put it on R&D stability. If you're working with us, we have containers, and we have instructions on how to do the poking, sealing, and general guidance for this study. The pro is that this is a low-cost way to assess the compatibility of the drug or vaccine with the actual polymer container that's going to be used in manufacturing. The con is that this does not assess the whole BFS process. The assessment of the whole BFS process comes with the next study called the feasibility trial. Okay, so to frame this up, the feasibility trial is the first time you run your product through the BFS process. No matter where you're executing your feasibility trial, you wanna look for some key features in a site which I've highlighted a few here and we're gonna discuss. All right, the site's quality status. Now here's an interesting trade-off. If you're executing your feasibility trial in the confines of a GMP operation, likely everyone on this call understands the limitations that that's going to bring. This might be the one scenario in pharmaceutical development where you're gonna actually prefer that your facility be non-GMP. So if needed during the execution of your feasibility study, this is gonna give you the flexibility to make changes to the equipment on the fly without worrying about disrupting validated systems. Your machine shop, why does this matter? Well, for example, if we're running a project where the drug and the device have a unique interplay, the ability to run product, drop the mold out of the machine, make modifications to it, and get it back up and running, all in, this, all in the time span of about a half a day is almost unheard of in this industry. In best case scenarios, uh, the machine shop is on the same campus as the bulk fill seal machines. And in most scenarios, the machine shop is a plane ride away. So size matters when it comes to BFS machine capabilities. And this builds off our last point. BFS machines come in different sizes and you'll want to appropriately match the scope of the project with the size of the BFS machine. For example, at Appyject, we use a Weiler Lab Plus machine for prototype designs, and then we scale up to a 434 machine from Romalog once the design is set and we're defining machine and process parameters. Formulation. In the early stages of feasibility, it's, it's hard to find BFS manufacturing and process flexibility in conjunction with a full formulation suite. A lot of times you'll find great BFS flexibility, but all you can run is water or saline. And then once you do find a site that can handle APIs and biologics, you've entered the realm of a GMP facility. This is always going to be a trade-off, but at the end of the day, you need to run your actual drug or vaccine in the feasibility trial, not a placebo. Laboratory. So in the feasibility stage, it's typically not worth transferring analytical test methods to the BFS manufacturing location. But thanks to overnight shipping, these samples for release and stability can be sent to the lab of the sponsor's choosing. But basic instruments on site for in-process pH and osmolarity, for example, are essential for, um, for testing on site, um, as well as having instrumentation for device testing, um, testing device functionality. And then the last point here on packaging, don't forget about the packaging for a feasibility trial. In BFS, some type of foil pouch is always utilized and to best mimic future manufacturing efforts, you want to be sure that your feasibility site has the capabilities to foil pouch and get those pouched units into the temperature storage conditions that you intend on storing your product. All right, so I've just touched on some of the key attributes you should look for when evaluating a site for your feasibility trial. Now let's take a deep cut into a feasibility study. All right, so here on the screen, we have a Romalog 434 machine. 
this machine is well suited for small scale R&D trials or for low to medium volume commercial products. Establishment of process parameters of this machine are very easily transferable to the same machine models at different locations or to the next level of commercial machine, Romolog 460 machine. In almost every case, the formulation of the drug product or vaccine is going to be the same whether you're doing BFS or you're doing glass filling. So today it's the formulation tank to the BFS connection where we'll pick up on our feasibility studies. All right, the first study is on temperature controls. So plan to run your blow fill seal machine at the nominal coolest settings that you can, but here's your chance to dial up the heat and explore how your product's going to fare at warmer conditions. And don't forget about the rest of the process. It's not just the BFS machine. In a commercial scenario, BFS units coming off the machine will need to get punched, leak detected, inspected, and packaged before they're placed in temperature control storage as finished, as finished goods. Here's your chance to do some simulations in that space and add heat stress to the process. Sterile filtration. Um, so as we heard in the video, FDA considers BFS advanced aseptic technology. So naturally we'll want to examine the sterile filtration parameters. BFS uses point of fill sterilization. So we'll want to ensure that the filter surface area to batch size ratio is appropriate and can keep up with the filling rate. For your study, if you're transitioning one of your existing products, it's time to break out that filter validation package for reference. And if you're doing a new product, some bench top work on filtration parameters is going to be helpful. In any case, perform a startup filtration purge study at this point and closely monitor the performance of the filters throughout the entire batch. And the last point, point, packaging. There's really two key studies here. The first one being light exposure. Now, if you have a light sensitive product, here's a chance to control the light exposure of the BFS units coming off the machine until the point where they're finally packaged. The second study on packaging is of the package units themselves. Um, and depending on how you the envision your commercial packaging looking like is going to envision is going to dictate how you want to package your feasibility trial units. Just remember, all foil is not created equal, and you need to consider if you need to purge your foil pouches with an inert gas before they're sealed up. All right, so those are my top top three studies that I look at when evaluating a feasibility trial. Um, now I'm going to take a little detour. Okay, so. I would be remiss to not mention how your non-simple solutions are handled in BFS. Here are a quick few notes on the, some of the common formulations that we often see. The first one is suspensions. So the elephant in the room here is that they cannot be sterile filtered. With BFS, that's really not a problem. This aseptic process is going to be handled just the same as a glass line, where you would connect a sterile tank to the BFS machine or filling machine, back steam it in place before filling. The other elephant in the room is that the suspension is gonna fall out in the myriad of BFS piping and give non-uniform fills. This is also not a problem with BFS as the equipment can be set up with a recirculation loop that keeps the product moving in the process piping even when filling is paused. Emulsions. Some of them can be sterile filtered and some of them cannot. If they cannot be sterile filtered, we handle it similar to as we would a suspension product. Um, the biggest, um, the biggest aspect to look at when you're looking at an emulsion is being mindful of the heat from the process and if that's going to break the emulsion. We will get to the heat in just a second. Viscous products, yes, you can do viscous products in blow fill seal. Up to about 100 centipoise is typically no problem with the standard system without any modifications. Um, and then with a little bit of engineering work of a standard system, you can be comfortable to about 300 centipoise. Viscosities beyond that are very doable. You just need to do a little more engineering work and get in touch with your BFS manufacturer. All right, and the last point here, biologics. Now, forget about a broad brush. A broad brush. I'm gonna use a paint roller here and just call out about every new drug modality you can think of as biologics. Some are suspended, some are emulsified, some are viscous, some are their own unique thing. Biologics, as I call them, is where clients usually get a little uncomfortable about, about the heat from the BFS process, which is gonna lead me to my next detour today, BFS heat. So if you know how BFS works, you know that plastic resin is extruded at about 170 degrees Celsius 
just moments before the containers are formed, filled, and hermetically sealed. Now, if you have an expensive biologic, biologic or a product with a known temperature sensitivity issue, this might make you a little squeamish. Here in the graph to, on the right, we have a characterization of BFS heat where we have two systems, the resin in the red and the drug product in blue, coming together to make a filled unit. Here we see a spike at about 45 degrees Celsius and then a return to ambient conditions within about five seconds. So bear in mind that this is a typical BFS process. At Appyject, um, we've done work on you know, mitigating this spike and returning to a colder temperature quicker. I will end this slide by saying, temperature sensitive products are not new to BFS. In the market today, we see complex molecules in BFS inhalation containers, persistent fibrosis and COPD indications. And in my experience, I've successfully executed numerous feasibility trials with sensitive molecules, some of them being vaccines needing cryo, cryo storage conditions. All right, let's get back to our feasibility study. So after your product is packaged and it's stored at the desired feasibility or the desired stability storage conditions, you'll want to ship that product back to your lab for release and stability testing. In addition to testing against the specifications of the C of A, you may want to consider collecting some preliminary leachables data here too. Now, since you're likely evaluating BFS as a drug delivery technology, you'll want to evaluate device testing at release and stability as well. And since we just touched on device testing, I'm just going to give a quick example of one test that we use. So this method, which we call squeeze force, is tied to user requirements for squeezing a blowfill seal container to deliver an injectable dose. In this example, we use a universal tester with customized fixtures for holding the device in place. Specifications for this example come from a mix of ISO standards and our own end user population data from our work that we've gathered working in global health. Here, 40 newtons is the limit for the squeeze force to deliver a dose at a greater than 95% dose accuracy. Now, methods like this are a little complex to develop, so having a solid method, method transfer strategy is absolutely critical if you're performing these tests on your own. But if you're working with us, we're happy to support testing, um, device testing throughout stability and release. And one more slide here on device testing. Even before feasibility trials, when we're developing prototype devices, we're de-risking issues in device functionality with modeling and simulations. Here um, on the right, we have some force diagram heat maps um, of a prototype dual chamber design. Container is providing rigidity on a certain axis. Now, by doing this, this saves several iterations in prototyping, and this yields better shots on goal once we actually start extruding plastic to make BFS containers. All right, it's time to do some fast forwarding now. You've received a report on your feasibility study focusing on the key observations, process parameters, and recommendations for future manufacturing. Your product has shown exceptional release and stability data, and now it's time to start preparing for your next studies. If you're working with the seamless operation, the team who oversaw the first set of feasibility work is going to begin planning on the next stage of the GMP development to begin commercialization. For Appyject, this is where we begin the next step of, our, of the journey with one of our distributed manufacturing partners. And this is when I hand things off to my colleague, Christian. Christian? Great, thank you, Joe. <clears throat> Before we begin our discussion on the next phase of development with GMP batches, now is a good time to take a step back and look at the overall benefits of transitioning to a BFS delivery system. Compared to existing drug container systems, BFS offers simplicity in several key dimensions. You heard a lot of this discussed in the video that was shared earlier. I wanna highlight a few uh, that are relevant to the GMP development phase. Fewer materials. Simply put, there are less materials needed to produce a BFS container compared to other primary container systems. Fewer materials, reduced complexity, and the risk for supply chain, chemical compatibility, and particulate issues. Compact and scalable. Fewer facilities are needed to produce the final product, and there is improved capacity to move quickly and respond to shifts in demand. Knowing that some of the benefits of the BFS manufacturing process, you will either need to build this infrastructure or partner with someone who already has it in place. 
There are many variations of the options on the screen, but they mostly fall into one of two categories. Partner with a CMO with existing BFS capability or build that capability internally. Your device partner and their network will also play a role in this decision. Choosing a distributed manufacturing pathway with a qualified contract manufacturing organization gives you access to their knowledge and existing capacity that can smooth the pathway towards a regulatory filing and successful commercial launch. Choosing an in-house manufacturing route will give you greater control and knowledge over time that comes with increased capital costs and time to purchase, install, validate the equipment and processes needed to operate a BFS manufacturing facility. Before we move on, we have another poll question for the audience. Corey, can you go ahead and launch that poll? Yes, thank you, Christian. I have launched the second and final poll question today for our audience members to respond to in real time. Just a reminder, uh, to respond to these poll questions, all you'll have to do is just click one of the radio buttons there and hit the submit button. And this time, the question we have for you is, very simply, um, what do you see as the biggest challenge in transitioning to BFS technology? And your options here are designing suitable BFS containers, ensuring material compatibility, navigating regulatory requirements, maintaining product stability and integrity, or building or accessing BFS manufacturing capacity. And uh, once more, the question is, what do you see as the biggest challenge in transitioning to BFS technology? And we'll leave the poll open a little while longer to allow the majority of the audience to get their votes in. We're just looking to get a sense of, given what you know about BFS and as you're looking to transition uh, towards it, um, what do you see as a potential challenge here? And, and in this case, the biggest challenge. And once more, those options are designing suitable BFS containers, ensure, ensuring material compatibility, navigating regulatory requirements, maintaining product stability and integrity, or building or accessing BFS manufacturing capacity. I'm going to leave the poll open just a touch longer to allow any uh, last minute audience members to get their votes in. Thank you to those who have voted already. If you haven't voted, I'm going to be about 10 more seconds. I'm going to go ahead and close the poll. Okay, excellent. Thank you so much. I'm going to go ahead and close the poll right now and we'll take a quick look at those results. So in response to this question about the biggest challenge in transitioning to BFS technology, uh, we saw majority votes, 60% come in at navigating regulatory requirements, and then 20% apiece for uh, ensuring material compatibility and uh, building or accessing BFS manufacturing capacity. Christian, I'm going to send things back to you. Great. All right. Can everyone, uh, can everyone see my slides, Corey? Yep. Screen is still sharing. Awesome. Thank you so much. All right, moving on. So once the manufacturing infrastructure is in place, a development program to transition from successful feasibility to regulatory submission will look something like this. Joe already walked us through the, what activities and outputs come from the feasibility phase. Each successive step will build upon that foundation to further refine the process knowledge and develop the materials and the data needed for a regulatory submission. The time to go through these steps can vary on many factors from the decision on a manufacturing infrastructure to the needs of the market opportunity. But you should be aware that there are certain elements in this development process, such as leachables and extractables program and the visual inspection development, both of which we'll talk about later, that will require significant amounts of time and cannot be compressed from a timeline perspective. The highest level, engineering batches will help you to improve your understanding of the process and establish key process parameters. Registration batches are run after the engineering batches are complete and the anticipated commercial process is established. The product produced here is used for long-term stability testing, your ENL program, device performance evaluation, and secondary packaging system assessment and validation. Registration batches are the handoff towards a successful regulatory filing. In our next section, Joe will walk us through some of those key regulatory items for consideration. It sees it syncs up well with our poll question uh, where a large portion of the audience is interested in that topic. Finally, you will need to complete a full process validation at some point after filing. Going down a layer of detail, what sorts of studies and parameters would be looked at during engineering batches and established prior to registration batches? I think it's helpful to initially look at potential studies with a unit operations lens. There are several technical considerations unique to BFS operations and these unit operations. The right device and manufacturing partners can help you navigate these studies successfully and at the right time for your unique situation and needs. There's an underlying benefit to having to do this. 
you will develop direct knowledge and have greater control of your primary container system than you do for your current platform. Stepping through each of these at a very high level, and you'll notice that Joe had touched on these at a feasibility level. With formulation, you'll be establishing things like mixing parameters and recipe development, setting the hold times between process steps and formulation, and looking at temperature requirements unique to your drug. Looking at the BFS process itself, you'll perform temperature performance uh, evaluations and studies at scale as you move up across sizes of BFS machines. You'll establish filling parameters, machine set points, and optimization. You'll begin looking at sterility assurance and controls, and then a deeper dive into device performance testing and the essential performance requirements for your device. And finally, the packaging and secondary packaging operations, you'll be looking at things like bulk hold times, often looking at how BFS containers could stay outside of a foil pouch for as long as 30 to 60 days, and then settings of that process equipment. Moving away from the unit operations view, many attributes of the drug product need to be well understood and characterized within the context of the manufacturing process. The more that you understand this going into the studies, the more focused those studies can be, bringing speed and simplicity. Joe talked about many of these factors in relation to feasibility. Each will get continued focus and process refinement during the GMP development runs. Viscosity has direct impacts on the filling process performance for accuracy and precision. Viscosity also impacts leak detection and visual inspection processes for the finished product. Temperature stability budget. If you have a well-defined and known thermal stability profile, temperature mapping studies around the BFS process can be conducted around those known limits. Other process controls, such as processing times in and out of refrigeration after filling can be studied and established. Without baseline information about your product, these studies will have to be broader at first and may require additional studies to refine those controls. Light sensitivity. If the product is light sensitive, studies to look at light intensity and duration throughout each process step will be necessary. The amount of time, the number of steps between the BFS filling and placement in a foil pouch becomes more critical. Oxygen. Your BFS container is likely to be made out of LDPE, HDPE, or polypropylene. These polymers do not have the same barrier properties of a glass system. If you know that the product or excipients are uniquely sensitive to oxygen, early studies and controls can be put into place to minimize exposure time. Finally, secondary packaging studies and out-of-pouch time studies can be conducted to look at the impacts on the drug and establish parameters for packaging operations, such as adding an inert gas to the foil pouch during the wrapping operation. Finally, looking at moisture loss. Similar to oxygen, polymer materials for the BFS container will allow some amount of water transmission. This will need to be studied and evaluated for storage at time step points throughout the process. With a change in primary container, a risk-based extractables and leachables program will be required. This will often be one of the longest and most expensive elements of a transition to a BFS container. Fortunately, this program can be similar in structure to what was done for the existing product. In some ways, this program is easier because there are now fewer materials interacting with the drug. Materials from your registration batches will likely be placed onto a stability program that then looks at leachables and extractables characteristics over time. At the highest and most basic level, you will need to plan on generating extractables profiles based on risk, completing a full risk assessment based on the results of that extractable study. There'll be time set aside for method development, and then finally, you'll need to demonstrate compatibility with a full leachables evaluation and study. As we've already mentioned, BFS processes are able to efficiently produce products at a high rate of speed and automation. At the same time, BFS processing by its very nature is good at controlling and minimizing the amount of particulate that ends up inside the containers. This creates a few unique and competing challenges. The flowchart on the screen is an adaptation of the visual inspection process flow found in USP 1790. and will help to highlight some of those challenges. Number one, for injectable products, 100% visual inspection of particulates is a requirement. Number two, the throughput and efficiency of BFS makes it necessary for that 100% inspection to be done in an automated manner. 100% manual inspection will not be feasible in most scenarios due to the number of inspectors needed to keep pace with the output of a BFS machine. And number three, 
BFS containers are often not round and not as clear as glass vials, making them harder to inspect for both humans and for machines. BFS containers fall under the category of difficult to inspect products as a product and container combination that has the potential to obscure particles, permitting limited capability for inspection of the total contents of the container. For difficult to inspect products, the dashed line pathway for supplemental testing becomes necessary. The visual inspection plan for any injectable product transitioning to BFS should start with the expectation of combining three elements, 100% automated visual inspection, AQL-based manual inspection, and the addition of supplemental testing. Knowing that the visual inspection program will need to include these three elements, where should you begin? The characteristics of a drug product and a particle risk assessment are the starting point. All further work builds upon this foundation. I do, I do want to highlight briefly a few key elements of this further work. You're going to need to develop defect kits of particles. Particle defect kits are hard to find, particle defects are hard to find in BFS processes because particles are rare. Making durable defect samples with soft BFS containers is more challenging than producing and maintaining defect kits for glass systems. These defect kits are critical because they will be used for the work in the manual and automated work streams that I'm gonna describe now. Manual method development and baseline studies are needed uh, and need to be done with the drug product and the final container design. This establishes the baseline of how an automated solution must perform. Essentially, you're, you're answering, what are human inspectors able to see or not see reliably for your specific device, container, and drug product? Automated visual inspection equipment for BFS products is not as common as equipment for glass systems. BFS cards, as we discussed before, are not round in many cases, are not singulated as individual uh, containers, not fully clear, and often present challenges to moving or swirling the liquid inside that enhances the visual inspection process. You will need to select an equipment partner very early on in the process to develop the equipment and inspection recipes needed to demonstrate equivalency or superiority to the human inspectors as you develop the manual methods. Moving on a bit from this conceptual framework that we just walked through, what might some of these elements look like in practice? As Joe had mentioned earlier, a key reference point for us is the work we've done in the development of Apigex's initial injection system and container design. Our challenge was to develop a manual visual inspection process from scratch for a new container and a water-like product. By walking through the process uh, on the previous slides, starting with a risk assessment and fabrication of defect kits, we ultimately created a manual visual inspection process specific to the container and drug combination. Some of the key elements in the final procedure included specifying light characteristics, the inspection timeframe, and the methods for hand manipulation of the BFX cards to initiate fluid movements to aid inspection. For automated inspection, we had a similar challenge. We selected a partner very early in our development program and worked closely with them to develop an automated solution that can inspect BFS cards at a rate to match the output of the BFS machine we plan to use for commercial production of the, of the product. This equipment was successfully built, installed, validated, and used to produce registration batch samples. The ultimate goal of the engineering runs that establish the process and the registration batches that produce samples from that process is to create a successful regulatory filing for the transition to a BFS container and injection system. Joe is now going to wrap up our time with a few key regulatory considerations that are critical to success. All right. Thank you, Christian. All right. So for those 60% of you um, that answered the last poll question, this is the section for you. Let me get going here. Okay, so to start things off, this is not a regulatory guidance. All countries have their own health authorities and pathways for approval. Pathways range from leveraging existing approvals to independent reviews of each product going into their market. Each drug delivery technology has its own specific requirements. Our recommendation, start early, get connected with your BFS regulatory team, 
and discuss the various regulatory options that blend the drug and the delivery systems. Out of the way. All right, so if you're working on a BFS injectables project, here are some pathways that we've considered for bringing, bringing products to market. In the US, you could follow your routine drug approval pathway and match that with a DMF for the container and an MAF for the needle. In the EU, you could follow the routine drug approval pathway and match that with a market authorization and a CE mark. And then last, if you're going into a low middle income country, you could leverage your existing approval in another market with a certificate of free sale to begin distribution in that market. Okay, so at Abject, we get a lot of questions on the topic of biolabors and clinical trials. Now, keep this in mind. This is from the context that you're transitioning an existing product into BFS. This is not for a chem new chemical entity or a new biologic entity. So we, we've received FDA feedback on this topic for a few products that we have in development, and we can't divulge specifics of that information over a webinar. But if you're working with us, once we do get connected, we can evaluate your product share information, and make our recommendations. What can be said here is that changing the delivery device should not automatically trigger a clinical trial, as long as the drug is delivered to the same spot in a similar way. Now, this can be said for injectables, inhalation products, ophthalmics, otics, et cetera. What we can say is on, on the biowaver front, your bigger concern that we've seen is that the product is Q1, Q2 to the RLD or the reference standard. That should be your main focus when it comes to a biolabor. All right, human factors. This is another topic we receive a lot of questions on. Basically, how human factors works with blow-fill seal-based delivery technologies. Now, if you've ever developed a product using an off-the-shelf delivery device, you may have kicked the human factors can down the road. But with BFS, you're gonna want that, you're gonna want to bring the human factors team in early and often. The upper image here on the right is the one that I showed earlier in the presentation. It helps remind us of two key things. One, with Blowfield Seal, the drug container is an integral component of the delivery device. And two, the ease of the design flexibility of Blowfield Seal allows for an iterative approach to the overall product development process. So this matters, and this matters because with off-the-shelf drug delivery devices, you typically bend your user requirements to fit within the limits of the device. With Blowfill Seal, you modify the device as the user requirements dictate throughout product development. All right, Christian, why don't you please bring us to a close? Thanks, Joe. As we come to a close, Joe and I are aware that some of what we presented here today can seem daunting at first glance. The benefits of transitioning to a BFS delivery system may seem clear enough, but you might be asking, where do I get started? You might be thinking the risks, the costs, the uncertainty seem too high if I look at all the work that is needed to get to a regulatory filing and approval. Our hope is to leave you with this thought. It's easy to start small, to learn, define, learn and define pieces, and then progressively go through the steps. At each step, there are on-ramps and off-ramps based on what you learned or information that's gathered. The decisions you make about device and manufacturing partners can go a long way towards lowering these risks and uncertainties. Stepping through each of these three areas. In feasibility, you can start with a feasibility assessment and start quickly with very little risk in time or cost. Work can be structured in defined pieces to get you to a clear decision point with the data that you need to move forward. GMP development after feasibility. Your GMP development progressively builds towards establishing the final process and producing the samples needed for final approval. The manufacturing network plan and selections of device and manufacturing partners are key decision points for you. Finally, as Joe just discussed, there are many potential regulatory pathways. Starting early and understanding the impacts of those selected pathways will drive a successful transition. Joe, if you want to go to the last slide, we can wrap up. All right. So with, with that, Joe and I would like to thank everyone for registering and taking the time to participate in this discussion. If you are interested in getting started in the evaluation of feasibility steps or just curious to learn more, we would love to have a discussion with you. I would encourage you to reach out to us 
at solutions at appyject.com or to explore our website content to learn more. Corey, I'll pass it back to you to transition to our Q&A. Excellent. Thank you both very much for that uh, really insightful presentation. And as you mentioned, Christian, we are now ready to begin the Q&A portion of the event. Uh, as we do so, I invite the audience to continue sending their questions or comments. Just a reminder, if you're attending via GoToWebinar, please use the questions chat box. And for those of you watching on LinkedIn Live events, feel free to post your questions using the comments tab on LinkedIn. Looks like we have already received uh, some questions from the audience here, and we'll see how many we can get through with the time that we have left. Uh, but rest assured, if uh, we don't have a chance to get to your question, we'll have a chance to follow up with you after the webinar and I'll flash that uh, contact info again that Christian just shared. Uh, first question that's come in here from the audience, probably best suited uh, for you Christian to take this one I think. Uh, this audience member was asking uh, in what ways uh, does BFS technology enhance, enhance the actual distribution of injectable products? Right, uh, thank you Corey. Yeah, so we didn't touch on that a lot in our presentation. We kind of stopped at the filling and placement in a box, but there's a lot of benefits on the distribution side. So after the BFS, uh, containers are in a foil pouch within a carton and cartons within a shipper. Uh, they would leave the, the manufacturing facility and go through their distribution pathway from uh, warehouses to the final point of use. Uh, some of the benefits are the, the BFS containers are lighter than a similar uh, dose volume in a glass container. So it's going to take less energy to get from point A to point B. Because they're lighter than made of plastic, they're more durable. Uh, you don't have to worry about things like glass breakage or uh, uh, challenges throughout the, the distribution cycle uh, uh, as well. It was mentioned in both the video and some of my comments that the overall carbon footprint of a BFS container compared to a similar glass vial or syringe format is a significant savings, a 60% kind of reduction in, in carbon footprint. But the supply chain can also be made more compact because you can fit more, more doses per unit volume depending on the, the container design and the final packaging format. So there's a lot of opportunities for that distribution channel to be more compact and, and more resilient. Great, excellent. Thank you for that, Christian. Um, another question that's come in here for the audience, and uh, maybe Joe, I'll send this one your way. Uh, during our second poll question, when we were talking about uh, challenges, one of the challenges that was uh, an option listed and we had a few votes for it was material um, compatibility. And this question was about um, what are the critical material compatibility issues that uh, need to be addressed when you are transitioning to BFS? Okay, excellent question. So I, I briefly touched on this and there aren't a lot of material compatibility issues that we commonly do see in Blue Pill Seal. Um, as mentioned, it's 100% virgin um, pharmaceutical grade, low density polyethylene. Um, you do compatibility testing on paper-based form and then you do it in the laboratory, do leachables testing. Um, the one thing that we didn't talk about, and we don't want to be like glass bashing, but LDPE is relatively inert and you're not going to have some of the issues that you do have with glass, like delamination and cracking and particles fragmenting. Um, so just, I mean, to kind of summarize on the question and the answer, not a ton of um, compatibility issues that we often see in Blofo Seal. Um, doing your due diligence early and often through a feasibility trial is the best way to assess that. Great, excellent, thank you for that. Um, another question here that's coming from the audience, and uh, I think Christian, this one's probably best suited for you and we'll throw it your way. Uh, this audience member was asking about how can uh, process, uh, process parameters be optimized to maintain stability and integrity of the injectable uh, product, and perhaps how would those parameters then impact device performance? So two-part question here, parameters to optimize and maintain stability and integrity, and then would that affect performance itself? Yeah, great. Uh, so there's there's a lot to this. Just it's probably its own own webinar. But just starting from the the formulation unit operations. So understanding the the temperatures and the 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 transitions that go go on there, making sure you're not losing product or efficacy through those steps through temperature deg degradation or other other challenges. Uh, the BFS process itself. We talked a lot throughout the presentation about temperature management. If you have a temperature sensitive uh, drug product, biologic or a vaccine making sure you do those studies and understanding uh, the impact of heat and, and removing that heat as soon as possible to main, and maintain integrity. Then it gets down to even uh, parameters of the BFS process of the temperature that, that you extrude the, the LDP material out at, 
and how that forms the container and the potential weak spots in the container where the seams are formed, uh, possibly creating container closure integrity risks and understanding the impacts as you go up or down the temperature scale uh, and very uh, deep into the BFS process of all the machine parameters of timings and set points and how it forms that container and the, the potential risks it has to having uh, CCI or, or breaches in container integrity. Moving on a little bit to the second part of that question on uh, device performance. A lot of these choices on uh, the formation of the container, the, the temperatures and the set points can impact the way that a container uh, behaves. Joe had mentioned and flashed in one of his slides about squeeze force. That's just one of several essential performance requirements for our current platform or, or any BFS container to be used as a device. You can do things in the process to make that squeeze force better or worse, depending on that perspective. And so understanding uh, by changing the, the extruder speed, you're making the wall thicknesses of the container potentially thicker and shifting that, that squeeze force over time. So understanding the impacts of, uh, of that are important. And there's a variety of other things, right? Eventually you need to put a needle on the end of the BFS container. You can alter kind of the forces for that in a good way or uh, a bad way. Um, so that's, that's just touching on it at, at a very basic level, and it gets even more as you look at secondary packaging, the process parameters chosen for the, the foil pouching operation, uh, the way that you overlay an inert gas to even the, 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 time, the dwell time and temperatures used for sealing those pouches could have impacts on long-term stability and efficacy of the drug product. Great, excellent. Thank you for that. Very, very comprehensive coverage uh, for that question. Uh, I think we have time for a couple more questions here from the audience. Um, but just a reminder, if we don't hit your question uh, during the presentation uh, itself today, you will have a chance to follow up after the webinar. We'll share that contact info again, and certainly the team at Apoject will have a chance to follow up with you. So uh, please feel free to continue sending your questions, even if we don't uh, have the time to hit them uh, with the time that we have left. This next question here, um, you know, we talked a bit about process parameters now uh, and kind of serves as a nice segue into this next question. Um, maybe, Joe, I'll, I'll pass this one over to you. This audience member is asking about why exactly you have to keep such a close eye on these sterile filtration parameters uh, with BFS. Ah, okay. I feel like I'm getting trolled by one of my, like, BFS feasibility study nerds out there. This is a great question. So, as I mentioned earlier, Blow fill seal in the standard process for solutions uses point of fill sterilization. Um, but for those that know like the intricate dynamics of that, if you just had filters and then your filler, as those filters became fouled, you would like have to adjust your process pressures to maintain the, the appropriate fill volume in the containers. So blow fill seal typically uses process tank, filters, buffer tank filling needles. So that basically takes the filter following out of the question. But what you do need to be concerned with is those filters following to the point where they're not going to be able to replenish that buffer tank in between fill. Um, great question. I wish I had a whiteboard to explain it further. Um, if, the, if the person who asked the question wants to talk about it further, get a hold of me. I'd love to chat with you about it. Great. Excellent. Thanks, Joe. Um, We'll have to work in a digital whiteboard or something into, into the next <laughs> webinar, maybe. Uh, I think this will be time our, for our last question here uh, that will uh, hit today. And uh, Christian, I'm going to throw this one uh, back to you. This audience member was asking if you could uh, expand on what characteristics of BFS containers make them a bit difficult to inspect. Is it only the clarity difference between the glass and plastic, or are there other uh, factors that make them uh, a touch difficult to inspect? Uh, absolutely, Corey. So there, there's a, a lot to un unpack there. So BFS is difficult to inspect in part because of the, the opacity of LDPE or other polymers that might be used uh, compared to glass and even amber glass vials. So it makes it harder to detect the particles that are there than uh, a similar dosage form uh, with a clear glass vial. Uh, so different particle types and sizes may not be visible to the human eye with uh, difficult to inspect products. Uh, even if those same particles of both size, morphology, and type are visible with a clear glass container that you're transitioning from. Difficult to inspect uh, products also require supplemental testing for USB 1790 that we talked about, in addition to that 100% inspection. 
the the parameters uh, that go into into both the manual and the automated inspection will be different than what you see for glass. But the overall inspection time for one unit should not be significantly longer. So the the, the time frame uh, during manufacturing should be similar. The inspection process and detectability will be different for difficult to inspect process, uh, products compared to glass. So if you're expecting to be able to see particulate in the same way for your glass product, it's gonna be very different. On the other hand, there really shouldn't be any particulate once a BFS process is properly set up, maintained and running at steady state, there's very little particulate. Uh, the automated visual inspection qualification process also will follow a similar pathway and ultimately must perform equivalently or uh, be shown to be superior to the human human inspectors. So, and then that's all baseline. And so the, the crazier or the wackier your BFS container gets, the further away from being round and clear, the more challenging it becomes. But there are solutions out there. It's just, it takes maybe a little bit more time, a little bit more sophistication to find that solution. Fantastic, thank you for that. Trade-offs everywhere, but, but very, very fascinating uh, area here. Um, and, and we'll be sure to follow up uh, with more info on that. Um, uh, through the contact info that I've shared up on screen uh, as we have reached the end of our Q&A session. Uh, as I was mentioning to our audience members, if we couldn't attend to your questions, if you have any further questions, or of course, if you're someone who's watching the recording of this webinar, um, solutions at apiject.com or just simply visit apiject.com and you'll have a way to uh, get in touch with the team and they'll have a chance to follow up with you. Uh, I do thank everyone for participating uh, here today. If you are attending via go to webinar, please don't forget to download the supporting materials in the handouts module, two great PDFs there from the Apiject team. Um, and I've also added a link in the chat box where you'll be able to view the recording of this event. You can of course share this link with your colleagues so that they may register to view it as well. You will also be receiving a follow-up email from Xtalks with more information on how to access that recording and after we wrap things up here a survey window will appear on your screen your participation in the survey is always appreciated as it helps us to improve our webinars for those of you who are watching on LinkedIn live we do encourage you to create an account on xtalks.com and register for this event which will not only give you access to today's recording but to our entire library of content uh, which is a good transition for me to mention that we have more from Apiject coming up uh, in the new year on February 27th uh, next webinar is entitled whoops there we go next webinar is entitled uh, expanding access to global markets with Blowfield Sill pre-filled drug delivery platform. So you'll be able to hear more from the Abject team uh, here with us at Xtalks in the new year. Keep an eye on xtalks.com for when registration becomes available for that webinar. Uh, now, at this point, I'd just like to thank our speakers once more for their excellent presentation. Christian, Joe, really appreciate your time here today. Hope our audience found it insightful and informative, and we wish you all a great rest of your day. Take care, everyone. Thanks, guys. Bye, everyone. Thank you.